The revelation of Yeshua to his disillusioned disciples on the road to Emmaus was a profound understanding of the Feast of the Lord as divinely designed prophetic shadow pictures of good things to come. The Western Gentile world has grown up in complete ignorance of these prophetic shadow pictures because the Emperor Constantine, in his bid to establish a new unifying religion, forbade anyone in his domain to celebrate the biblical feast. He replaced them with the celebrations of Babylonian and Roman sun god worship, the worship of Easter, the Babylonian fertility goddess, and the worship of Nimrod, reincarnated as little baby Tammuz at the time of the winter Saturnalia, December 25th. We are leaving behind the pagan roots of Constantinian churchianity and once again earnestly contending for the faith once delivered to the first century Jewish followers of the Jewish Messiah, without the man-made religion of Pharisaic Judaism or paganized churchianity. This is the greatest story never told. It's all about Yeshua, the prophet, the promised Messiah. Join me here in the land of Israel as we take a chronological and archeological journey through the Gospels. You have never seen anything like this before. I'm Michael Rood, prepare for a rude awakening. The last instructions of Jesus to his disciples were, go into all the nations of the world, starting in Jerusalem, and make disciples. Teach them to obey everything I have commanded you. Teach them everything I taught you. When I was 17, after a lifetime of immersing myself in the Bible-believing church culture in America, I suddenly realized that I did not understand what Jesus taught. I knew stories about Jesus and just about every other character in the Bible, but I could not in any intelligible fashion articulate the message he and his disciples were preaching to the multitude throughout the Galilee. I simply did not understand what Jesus told his disciples to teach their disciples. I was, however, a good disciple of my denomination. I was lightning fast when it came to finding a Bible verse and a quick draw sword drill. I was the quickest off the electronic pad when I rose to answer an obscure Bible question during quiz team competitions. I knew every stanza of just as I am. But when John the Baptist cried, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, I had no idea from what the people had to repent. In my church culture, I knew what it meant to repent. Stop smoking, stop drinking, stop playing cards, stop dancing, stop going to movies, stop wearing tight jeans, cut your hair, and don't hold hands before you're married. But in the Jewish culture of the first century, I hadn't the foggiest notion. What did John's words mean to them, to the people to whom he was sent? What did repent mean to them? Even though we have the majority of the gospel records coming directly to us through the Greek language, the gospels do not portray a Greek culture. It was a Jewish culture that was rooted in their current cultural interpretation of the Torah. Torah means the instructions, and specifically the instructions God delivered to the nation of Israel through Moses at Mount Sinai. Those instructions are contained in one scroll, the five books of Moses, Bereshit, Shemot, Barikra, Bedbar, and Devarim, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. The history of Israel is a roller coaster ride of the only nation on earth that goes from careful observance of the commandments in the Torah to total immersion in the abominations of pagan religions. 
The testimonies of these centuries of vacillations is recorded in the historical writings that follow the Torah in the English Bible. The books of Joshua, Judges, Ruth, the four books of the kings, and the chronicles of the kings of Israel that take us up to the time of the Babylonian captivity. The books of the prophets detail Israel's infractions against the Torah and warnings of the repercussions. They speak of the destruction of the nation and their future regathering from among the nations. Both Isaiah's and Jeremiah's message could be summed up in one word, teshuvah, repent, return. The same message of John the Baptist. The books of the prophets warn of and the historical writings conclude with the carrying away of the population of the entire nation of Israel, both the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. Because of the rejection of the Torah in their blatant, unbridled descent into pagan worship, the 10 northern tribes of Israel were removed from the promised land and dispersed throughout the Assyrian empire. A few of the faithful made their way down to Judea, but the rest are known today in Judaism as the Lost Ten Tribes. All those living in Judea who became referred to as Judeans and later as Jews were ejected from the Promised Land because of our disobedience to God's instructions concerning the agricultural land Sabbath that was to occur one year in seven. Moses prophesied that we would be forcibly removed from the land and the land would have its rest if we did not let the land rest while we were in it. For the 490 years preceding the Babylonian captivity, we disobeyed God and refused to let the land rest. We owed him 70 years and we spent it in Babylon. The book of Daniel chronicles the years that we spent in Babylon and includes the divine revelation of when Israel's Messiah would come. 69 sevens or 483 years after the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. The books of Nehemiah and Ezra tell of our repatriation into the promised land and Ezra records the exact date that we left Babylon under Artaxerxes' command the first day of the first month in the seventh year of the reign of Artaxerxes, 457 BCE, 483 years before John the Baptist heralded Jesus as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, the first day of the first month, 27 of the Common Era. The book of Esther records what happened to the Jews who stayed behind in Babylon a prophetic shadow of those who do not return when the doors open. The books oft referred to as the minor prophets are not minor at all. Beside calling for a return to the Torah, they give us specific information of where the Messiah would be born, that he would be wounded by the occupying army, and that he would relinquish his authority to rule over Israel until a future time when Israel is brought back from their 2,000 year exile. The Torah, the five books of Moses, the Nevi'im, the prophets, and the Ketuvim, the writings, the historical records, are referred to collectively by the Hebrew acronym Tanakh. Jesus spoke of the things written of him in the Torah, the prophets, and the writings, the Tanakh. If we are going to understand what the gospel of the kingdom meant to the Jews in the days of Jesus, we are going to have to look at the scriptures from their perspective. What did those words and teachings mean to those who lived in that culture? to those who were raised with both the instructions of the Almighty and raised with the diverse religious systems that dominated first century Israel. We need to get an understanding of the religious environment of Israel in the time of Jesus in order to comprehend the gospel of the kingdom and how it applies directly to us today.
In first century Israel, Phariseeism was the dominant religion in the land, and had been so for nearly 300 years. The Pharisees were in charge of the Sanhedrin, the ruling body of Israel, and their synagogues were the mainstay of Jewish religious life in every community in Israel and beyond. The Sadducees, on the other hand, were the priest in charge of the Jerusalem temple service. These two religious factions were in conflict on innumerable issues, but they did agree on one very important matter. Jesus was ruining their party. To understand Jesus' ongoing conflict with the religious leaders of his day, it is imperative that we understand the foundational commandment in the Torah, which is repeated in the fifth gospel, the book of the Revelation. In Deuteronomy chapter four, verse two, Moses said, "'Ye shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall you diminish aught from it, that you may keep the commandments of Yehovah your God, which I command you." Why is this the foundational commandment in the Torah? Because once one adds to the revelation or subtracts from the commandments of the Almighty, we no longer have the commandments of God or the revelation of his will. We have a man-made religious system. In Revelation 22, 18, Jesus said, if any man shall add unto the things written in this book, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life. If one adds to or takes away from the words of Jesus, we no longer have the words of Jesus, the gospel of the kingdom, or a part in the world to come. In that light, let's look at the two dominant religious systems of Jesus' day and see if we can acquire some insight into the gospel of the kingdom. The word Pharisee comes from the Hebrew word proshim, which means separated ones. In their desire to live a holy life, the Pharisees developed rules that separated them from every other religious sect and commoner in the land of Israel. They would not eat any food unless they were in a state of ritual purity. To affect this invented system of holiness, they made hundreds of rules concerning what prayers were to be said over particular kinds of foods, what plates were to be used for particular kinds of foods, how one was to wash and sanctify certain kinds of vessels, and whether certain types of ovens and utensils could contract ritual impurity. And if they did, how to purify them. All this they did in order to eat unsanctified meat, common food in a state of ritual purity. Not one word of such sanctifying antics is suggested in the Torah. The Pharisees, furthermore, enacted more than 500 laws governing the keeping of the Sabbath day, including what constitutes forbidden work, how far one may walk on the Sabbath, and what one must do before the Sabbath in order to carry anything on the Sabbath. Jesus not only broke their rules, he commanded those that he healed on the Sabbath to also break their rules. Modern day Judaism is ancient Phariseeism. It is a proud ancient tradition. Their leaders are called rabbi, which literally means great one which explains why Jesus forbade his followers from using the title, explaining he was the only great one. In the synagogues of Jesus' day, there was a special chair called the Seat of Moses. From that seat of Mosaic authority, the rabbi can enact what are called in Hebrew, takanot. The term takanot is legally defined in Judaism as laws enacted by the rabbis which change or negate Torah law. In fact, the rabbis claim that when they make takanot, even the Almighty must obey their decision. But even their definition exposes takanot as blatant violations of the Torah. No one is ever allowed to add, subtract, or change the commandments given to us by God through Moses. The Pharisees claim 
that their rules form a secondary fence around the Torah, which will keep people from breaking the Torah. That sounds noble. The Torah indeed is described as a protective fence around God's people. All those who are outside of the fence are outside of God's protection and are under a curse. However, the fence itself tells us that no one is ever authorized to add to or subtract from the commandments. No one is allowed to build another fence. In reality, the Pharisees, like all religions, break down the fence and make a new fence in which to confine their sheep for easy fleecing. In the Gospels, the Sadducees were often referred to in the plural as the high priests. They were in charge of the temple service. The Sadducees, or in Hebrew, Zadokim, adopted their name from the sons of Zadok, a righteous lineage of priests who served in the temple before the Babylonian captivity. But the priest ranks had been adulterated by political appointees who were neither from the family of Aaron nor the tribe of Levi. Some of the Sadducees did not even believe in the resurrection, which led to a personal prosperity-driven, grace-perversion lifestyle of eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. They used their power to abuse people, as did the sons of the high priest, Eli. The Sadducees, like the Pharisees, made up their own rules and disregarded the instructions in the Torah any time they found it advantageous. But they are not alone in their addition and subtraction to the commandments. The commandments that Yeshua preached, lived, and endorsed have been replaced by the man-made rules of 50,000 Christian denominations. But thankfully, these rules have no more authority than the Takanot of the Pharisees. Until we know the truth of the gospel of the kingdom, we will be in bondage to the rules and regulations of men who have invented their own religious systems. But as Jesus said, when we know the truth, the truth will set us free. In our journey to discover the gospel of the kingdom, we are going to follow the events in Jesus' ministry according to the order detailed in my book, The Chronological Gospels, The Life and 70-Week Ministry of the Messiah. It is based on the CKJV, the corrected King James Version. This version of the Gospels utilizes every verse of the 1611 King James, but updates the language and spelling and corrects errors introduced by translators who were unfamiliar with the land, language, and culture of first century Israel, by whom and to whom it was originally addressed. In 1604, King James of England authorized the translation of the scriptures into English. Over 80% of the translation was taken directly from William Tyndale's work. The King James translators acknowledged in their dedication, we never thought from the beginning that we should need to make a new translation, but to make a good one better. In 1611, three teams of scholars completed their translations and published the King James Authorized Version. It has since been corrected and updated several times. The meaning of many words has changed significantly since 1611. We are now reading the 1769 King James Version. But beyond correcting the obvious translation errors, by far the most significant contribution of the chronological gospels is that every one of the more than 300 events in Jesus' life and ministry have been reconstructed in chronological order. Without the correct sequence in time, there is no cause and effect. We are left with numbered sound bites, what we now call verses, that are commonly taken out of context and spiritualized. The plain text is seldom, if ever, understood. 
A primary example of a gross mistranslation of the text is found in Luke 9, 51, which reads in the King James, and it came to pass when the time was come that he should be received up, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. Concerning the peculiar words received up, the Geneva Bible, which predates the King James, adds a note, Christ goes willingly to death. The Christian Standard Bible adds a note, his ascension. The Roman Catholic version reads, the time of his assumption. The New Jerusalem Bible reads, the time drew near for him to be taken up. The New American Standard reads, when the days were approaching for his ascension. The New International Version, the NIV reads, the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven. They added the words to heaven, but unlike the King James Version, they did not italicize the added words to alert us that they were adding to the text. The New Living Translation and Complete Jewish Bible both conclude, the time drew near for him to ascend into heaven. Wait just a minute. This is Luke 9.51. His ascension does not transpire until Luke 24.51, 15 chapters later. Jesus is going to go up to Jerusalem five more times before his ascension into heaven. What did every one of these translators miss since the 1500s? The words translated received up, his ascent, assumption, and ascend into heaven are from the Greek word that was used to translate the Hebrew term aliyah, which simply means go up. A common Hebrew word that has been used for thousands of years. We go up to Jerusalem for the feast of the Lord. We go up three times a year. I live in northern Israel, and we still go up to Jerusalem today. It is a higher elevation, both physically and spiritually. Jesus is not ascending into heaven. He is going up to the Feast of Tabernacles, which is detailed later in the same chapter of Luke. Let's look at the greater context of this verse, which spans more than four months. At the beginning of the summer, Jesus reveals himself to a Gentile Samaritan woman at a well at the foot of Mount Gerizim. This results in the Samaritans acknowledging him as the Messiah, the savior of the world. He spends two days with them, teaching the gospel of the kingdom. Now, four months later, his disciples go into the same village to secure provisions for the final day's journey up to the Feast of Tabernacles. The disciples return, so infuriated that they want to call fire down from heaven and toast those ungrateful Samaritans. The same people who four months before acknowledged Jesus as the Messiah now refuse to sell them any provisions as they go up to Jerusalem for the Feast of Tabernacles. Why? The 10th commandment in the Samaritan version of the Torah reads, Thou shalt worship on Mount Gerizim. The woman at the well asked Jesus to clarify this problem text. She recognized he was a prophet because he told her whole life story. Now she wanted clarification concerning the most critical issue that separated the Samaritans from the Jews. She said, our fathers commanded us to worship on this mountain, Mount Gerizim. The Jews say to worship on Mount Moriah in Jerusalem, what do you say? Four months after Jesus was so warmly welcomed by the entire village, he is rudely rejected because when the time came for Jesus to aliyah, go up, not to heaven, but to the Feast of Tabernacles, he set his face to go to Jerusalem, not Mount Gerizim. Jesus was not going to play church with them on Mount Gerizim according to their altered version of the Bible. He will obey the Torah 
even if he has to go without food. If we do not understand the critical context of time, we can have Jesus ascending to heaven 15 chapters too early and completely miss the point of this prime example of the gospel of the kingdom. If we do not understand the creator's reckoning of time and the prophetic significance and timing of the feast of the Lord, we can blindly follow bad Gentile translations for hundreds of years. But in this series, we are going to let Jews interpret the scriptures the Jews wrote, and the Gentiles can interpret all the scriptures the Gentiles wrote. Good luck with that.